Pregnancy Part 2. The goal of maternity care is going to be that healthy pregnancy with a physically safe and emotionally satisfying outcome for the mother, infant, and family. This is obtained by consistent health supervision and surveillance. They're highly recommended to achieve this goal. Some terms that you need to be familiar with, gravidity, is the number of pregnancies a woman has had, irregardless of the outcome. Par parity or para is the number of pregnancies that have reached 20 or more weeks. GTPAL is gravidity, term, preterm, abortions, whether miscarriage or elective, and living children. Some um, Prefixes that will help you determine what a word means. Nulla, N-U-L-L-I, means none. Prima, P-R-I-M-I, is first. And multi is more than one. So how do we figure out the GTPAL? This is dependent on, again, the number of pregnancies, the number of deliveries, any abortions, um, etc. So we have an example of a woman who has two live children. One is born at 37 weeks and one is born at 39 weeks gestation and a miscarriage at 8 weeks gestation. We have G3 because she's been pregnant three times, P2. So she has delivered two live children. But if we go to the GTPAL, then it would be G3, T2, P0, A1, and L2. She's had three pregnancies. She has delivered two at term, which 37 weeks, again, depending on your sources, can be term. She has had uh, no preterm. She has had one abortion, which uh, is another word for miscarriage. And she has two live children. Signs of pregnancy. There's three signs and symptoms of pregnancy. We start off with presumptive. Presumptive signs are noted by the woman, and they may consist of amenorrhea, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, breast changes, pigmentation changes, urinary frequency, and quickening. Now, understand that they are considered presumptive because any one of these symptoms can be caused by something else other than pregnancy. And the same way with probable. All of the probable symptoms can be caused by something else other than pregnancy. Probable signs of pregnancy are changes that are observed by an examiner, whether it's a physician or a nurse practitioner, etc. We have the Chadwick sign which is a violet bluish color of the vaginal mucous membranes because of increased vascularity. The Goodell sign, which is softening of the cervix. The Heger sign, which is softening of the lower segment of the uterus. Belotment, which is movability of a floating object. Pregnancy tests, uh, you know, pregnancy tests, you can have false positives. Braxton Hicks contractions, they're not necessarily caused by a contracting uterus. Pregnancy tests, and the McDonald's sign, which is the ability to flex the uterus against the cervix. I'm sorry, I said pregnancy test twice. I just now caught that. And then the last sign of pregnancy are positive signs. These are signs from a fetus. You can actually hear a fetal heartbeat. You can palpate fetal movements. You see a fetus on a sonogram. Those are all positive signs of pregnancy. 
just one of those cute little signs or slides to maybe help things uh, solidify in your mind. The initial visit when a woman suspects she is pregnant should be as soon as possible following conception. It's going to be pretty lengthy. The healthcare staff will gather an obstetric history including the length of gestations, weight of infant type of deliveries and labor experiences, any maternal complications or infant complications if the woman has had a pregnancy before. How does she intend to feed her infant? Has she ever had any anesthesia, anesthesia used in the past? What is her menstrual history, contraceptive history, medical surgical history, family history, partner's health history, and psychosocial history, including does she smoke or drink alcohol? Does she have cats in the family as pets? It will include a physical exam to detect any undiagnosed physical problems. Urine will be monitored for protein and glucose, and there are several lab tests that are drawn on the initial uh, visit, like testing immunity of several different diseases, the blood type, and doing a CBC. Vital signs will be obtained, and remember that position will greatly affect the blood pressure. Subsequent visits, the wom uh, woman will have her vital signs monitored, her weight checked, the fundal height measured, and the fetal heart rate noted. Fetal activity will also be monitored. The physician will also monitor for warning signs of complications, infections, and other signs and symptoms of labor. A blood glucose screening is performed about 24 to 28 weeks gestation. Pelvic examinations are performed in the last month to check the condition of the cervix and the descent of the fetus. A possible sonogram is done to determine gestational age or fetal well-being and or placental implantation. Biophysical profile can be done along with uh, a non-stress test to ascertain fetal well-being and it will measure fetal movements, breathing movements, amount of amniotic fluid. Again, it's done in conjunction with the usual sonogram. Measurements will be obtained including a fetal heart rate and reactivity, which is what the non-stress test is going to do. It's looking for fetal heart reactivity with fetal movement and or contractions. Kick counts is something else that can be done where the number of times a fetus moves within a specified time frame is counted. An amniocentesis is aspiration of amniotic fluid to test for genetic anomalies or fetal lung maturity. And alpha fetal protein is a blood test that is done for genetic anomalies. This is a test that is supposed to be offered to every woman, but unless there's a history of fetal abnormalities in the family, it's usually the older woman that might have it done, but then you have to question if they do find a fetal abnormality such as Down syndrome, etc., what is mom going to do? Is she going to maintain the pregnancy or is she going to want to terminate it? Does she want to even be put in that position? Some neat little slides to kind of show you some of the tests that are done. To determine when a woman is due, we use Nagley's rule. You will determine the first day of the last normal menstrual period. Subtract three months and add seven days and if necessary change the year if it's appropriate. So example, the last known menstrual period was December 8th. We're going to add three months, which would be February, and add seven days, or subtract three months. Add three, yeah, anyway, the due date is going to be February 27th. Mm 
never mind. Let me redo this again. I am so confused, but I really do know what I'm talking about. Okay, subtract three months. If the last known menstrual period is December 8th, then you are going to subtract three months, which would be September. You will add seven days, which will be the 15th, and change the year as necessary. So it would be 2014. So this woman's due date would have been September 14th, 20, September 15th, 2014. For the second example, last known menstrual period is February 27th, 2012. You subtract three months, it would be November. You add seven days, which would make it the fifth, and change the year as necessary. And it would be 2012 also. So this woman's due date would be November 5th, 2012. And I understand I have the wrong date here, uh, November 5th, 2012, not 2013. But if you look up here, then it says 2013. On the previous slide, it was 2012. You get it. I'm human. I make mistakes. But at least I admit it. Education should be provided to all women of childbearing age as to an appropriate diet because their diet can be uh, crucial if they become pregnant and they don't know it. Weight gain, you need to review the weight distribution chart. A normal weight woman should gain 25 to 35 pounds. With twins, she should gain 37 to 54 pounds. If the woman is underweight when she becomes pregnant, 28 to 40 pounds is normal. If she's overweight, 11 to 25 pounds is what the doctors usually recommend. And if she's pregnant with twins and overweight, 31 to 50 pounds. If she's obese, 11 to 15 pounds. Pregnant with twins and obese, 25 to 42 pounds. The pattern of weight gain is extremely important, and most of that weight gain should be in the third trimester. We should encourage these women to limit caffeine, because babies are stimulated just as mom is with caffeine. Folate intake decreases occurrence of neural tube defects such as spina bifida and cleft lip and palate dis deformities. So uh, a folate intake should be increased during the first few months of pregnancy. And nutrients as much as possible should be obtained from the diet. Prenatal vitamins may cause nausea, so a lot of times recommending that women take prenatal vitamins at bedtime or take them with food or milk may help relieve that nausea. Supplements that women are often requested to take in addition to prenatal vi vitamins would be the iron, and they need to have 30 milligrams a day. Folic acid is recommended at conception and then to supplement for the first trimester of the pregnancy up to 400 micrograms. And calcium, it's recommended to have 1200 milligrams. Realize that blood pressure medications can cause hypotension, dizziness, bradycardia, and the mother may be dependent on the blood pressure medications, so we have to keep this in, into account as we're dealing with her prenatally. Miscellaneous things that we need to include in education is exercise. Exercise is very important. Some of the more important ones and less stressful ones are going to be the walking and Kegel exercises should always be encouraged. If a woman asks about traveling or working, usually this is allowed but prolonged periods of sitting is discouraged and women should be encouraged to ambulate at least every hour. 
So let's look at some of the changes in the female body when she becomes pregnant. The pregnant body is going to go through changes in most body systems and functions. The term uterus weighs 800 to 1200 grams and it's 16 to 17 times more than a non-pregnant weight. The uterus will grow in a predictable pattern throughout pregnancy. Then when the fetal head descends, which is called lightning, the uterus will drop slightly in the abdominal cavity as well. Souffle is the sound of blood circulating through the placenta and it can be heard when you auscultate over the uterus. It is synchronous with the maternal pulse. Again, the Heger sign is softening of the lower segment of the uterus. The McDonald sign is the ability to flex the uterus against the cervix. Braxton Hicks contractions are considered to be irregular contractions. And belotment is the ability to displace the fetus when you do a vaginal exam. Due to an increase in estrogen, the cervix will get congested with blood. This causes the bluish purple color that extends into the vagina and the labia called the Chadwick sign. The cervix begins to soften later in pregnancy and this is called the Goodell sign. A thick mucus plug which seals the uterus shut, helping the uterus remain a closed system, will help prevent infection. The vagina and vulva turn bluish purple because of the increased vascularity and there's an increase in thick white discharge. There's also an increased risk of yeast infections. The ovaries are going to secrete progesterone for the first six to seven weeks to prevent rejection of the fetus and then the placenta will take over that function after that. The breasts will increase in size and become highly vascular. The nipples will become darker and more erect and the areola becomes larger and more pigmented. Colostrum production, which is that very first milk produced by the breast, begins at 12 to 16 weeks and can be expressed by the third trimester. This is a uterine growth chart and it kind of shows you where the uterus or the fundus will be measured uh, at the prenatal appointments uh, corresponding with how many weeks gestation. Take a look at these pictures of anatomy and by looking at these pictures you can see why pregnant women, especially closer to term they get, the more discomforts they have. If you look at where all of their internal organs are compared to pregnant versus non-pregnant. And it also has many other um, implications with aches and pains. Again, just one of those neat little slides that show you some of the changes that happen in a woman when she's pregnant. With the heart, there is some slight cardiac hypertrophy and displacement when mom is pregnant and her heart rate will increase 10 to 15 beats per minute more so with multifetal pregnancies. She has an increased blood volume of 40 to 45 percent, again greater with multifetal pregnancies. Cardiac output increases 30 to 50 percent, but by 40 weeks gestation it will decline to 20 percent. Blood pressure is affected by the positioning of the woman. Obtain each prenatal reading in the same arm with the woman in the same position if you want comparable readings. Blood pressure is higher with the woman sitting rather than lying down. Blood pressure approaching or over 140 over 90 requires attention. A systolic pressure may decrease slightly or remain the same as the pregnancy advances and the diastolic pressure will decrease until 24 to 32 weeks before it gradually increases to the pre-pregnancy levels. Supine hypotension can occur if mom lays on her back and the fetus compresses the vena cava. 
and orthostatic hypotension is very common with pregnancy. Respiratory adaptation occurs to provide for maternal and fetal needs. Maternal oxygen requirement increases as half of the oxygen is used by the fetus and the placenta. So she requires more or a higher level of oxygen. Hormonal changes. The progest progesterone is a major factor in respiratory changes and actually causes mild hyperventilation. Estrogen relaxes ligaments of the rib cage and it permits increased chest expansion. It allows increased vascularity of mucous membranes. And the upper respiratory tract is more vascular and this can cause nasal and or ear congestion. Physical changes in the respiratory system. Dyspnea is very possible until lightning occurs. Remember this is when the fetus drops further into the pelvis. And as the pregnancy progresses and the fetus grows, the diaphragm has decreased room to expand. With gastrointestinal, the appetite is usually increased if the woman is not nauseated. She may experience cravings and smells may trigger nausea. Morning sickness usually will extend from four to six weeks of gestation to the end of the third month. Sometimes increasing protein can help in preventing episodes of nausea and vomiting or morning sickness or eating something very bland such as toast or crackers before she gets out of bed can help minimize or prevent some of these episodes. The mouth may have bleeding gums or gingivitis or excessive salivation which is called tyolism. The esophagus reflux of acidic stomach contents can cause heartburns and if you go back to the picture of the pregnant woman versus the non-pregnant woman you can see how the abdominal contents are pressing on the esophagus or the stomach causing things to reflux up. The large and small intestine have decreased tone and motility because of elevated levels of progesterone, this relaxes all smooth muscle. The small intestine will take longer to empty. So constipation is very common due to decreased motility in the large intestine. Hemorrhoids are also very common. Liver and gallbladder. The liver is pushed upward and backward in the last trimester. Liver function is altered. The gallbladder emptying time is prolonged and mom is now predisposed to gallstones. So cholecystitis is something that is very common in a pregnant woman. And abdominal discomfort. Mom may complain of pelvic heaviness and she may have abdominal pain because of that round ligament pain and tension and look very closely at the picture uh, in the upper left hand corner how that round ligament is attached. The larger the pregnancy grows the more tension and stress is put on that ligament and the more discomfort can be caused. And we're not talking just ca uh, discomfort in the upper abdomen where it attaches in the lower abdomen or the pelvic area can also be discomfort. In the first and third trimester, there is an increase in frequency and urgency of urination due to physical and hormonal causes. Urinary frequency in the first trimester is from an exaggerated uterine anti-reflection caused by softening. In the second trimester, there is decreased urgency. There's also an increase in UTIs because pregnant women are prone to bacteria. They may be asymptomatic, possibly due to urine flow being partially obstructed at the ureters and resulting stasis of urine. Glycosuria 
is common during pregnancy due to increased renal plasma flow and glomular filtration rate. And protein in the urine is very common. It does not necessarily indicate abnormal kidney function or preeclampsia though. But urine protein is monitored at every visit, whether they do a full urinalysis or not. Integumentary. Acne, acne will frequently clear during pregnancy. Most moms have increased perspiration due to increased vascularity. Hyperpigmentation is dark patches of skin. We sometimes see a mask of pregnancy, which will be brownish patches. It's also called cloasma or melasma over the cheeks, nose, and forehead. This will occur in 50 to 70 percent of women and usually resolves after giving birth. Linea alba is a pigmented line from the symphysis pubis to the top of the fundus, and sometimes that can darken to become linea nigra. And if you look at the picture of the woman in the lower right hand corner, you can see that linea nigra line. Separation of underlying connective tissue results in stretch marks or stria gravidarum. They are slightly depressed streaks that occur in areas of the body that stretch the most. And again, the picture of the woman in the lower right hand corner, you see lots and lots of stretch marks. These can occur on the abdomen, the thighs, and the breasts. Vascular spiders or angiomas are tiny raised pulsating arterioles on the neck, thorax, face, and arms that disappear shortly after birth. They occur in 65% of Caucasian women and 10% of Afri African Americans. Palmer erythema is a pinkish red diffuse mottling or blotches over the palms of the hands due to increased estrogen levels, again occurring in about 60% of Caucasian women and 35% of African American women. Hair and nails grow a lot more rapidly. Fetal demands of calcium increase, so mom needs to increase her calcium intakes. The calcium does not deplete from mother's bone and teeth to feed the fetus, but extra calcium is required to help fetal bones, etc. Progesterone uh, causes a gradual softening of the pelvic cartilage and connective tissues to fac facilitate passage of the fetus during birth. This causes pelvic instability and a waddling gait, especially in the later pregnancies and especially if mom is a multi-para. Increased weight also affects the posture and if you look at the pictures up above you can see the difference in the lordosis uh, posture. Women need to be aware of this and they need to try and compensate. Don't allow the pull of that baby to um, pull the back out of shape and cause the lordosis. It can also cause a low backache in women. Muscles of the abdominal wall will stretch and lose some tone. Again, those rectus abdominis muscles may separate, and that round ligament pain is common as that fetus grows, causing abdominal pain. Twenty percent of women will have some degree of painless bleeding or spotting during early gestation. Bleeding can be caused by intercourse, but all instances of bleeding should be evaluated. Progesterone and estrogen cause fat to deposit in subcutaneous tissues. So women can have an average weight gain, again recommended at 25 to 35 pounds. Estrogen alters the metabolism of nutrients. More insulin is required as the pregnancy progresses. And the hormone human placental lactogen prolactin, estrogen, progesterone, and cortisol cause maternal resistance to insulin, which provides the fetus with the glucose that's necessary for growth. 
Oxytocin is produced in increasing amounts as the pregnancy advances. And near the end of the pregnancy, it will stimulate uterine contractions. But the progesterone will prevent those contractions until mom is near the end of term. Oxytocin also stimulates the letdown reflex or the milk ejection reflex when mom is nursing. Thyroid production increases during pregnancy and calcium metabolism also decrease, increases due to hyperparathyroidism. And lastly, with the eye the cornea thickens due to edema and this may cause contact wearers to have discomfort. There may be some mild hearing loss that's temporary due to changes in the mucous membrane of the eustachian tubes, again caused by estrogen levels. And the immune system may be altered to allow, foreign, to allow the foreign body, which is the fetus, to grow inside the mother. And this causes resistance to infection because of a reduced white blood cell count function which may cause autoimmune conditions to decrease or improve during pregnancy.